Okay, uh, I'm talking about, I've been working with Ember for a while. I'm, I'm talking about my experience building web apps with Ember. My name is Miguel Camba. I'm from Spain, obviously. Uh, you can f reach me in any of these places. And I have, I am entitled to take, free, take speak here because I know how to pronounce Embreño, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been working with Ruby and Ember for a while, but like most of you, I imagine, mostly in desktop. And the thing is, my most complex project in Ember probably is this one. It's an online video game in Ember. Uh, it's a fantasy manager, football fantasy manager. And there is a few interesting facts about this game. It's a very big project. It has been two years in development. It began in Ember 2.0 Beta 6, something like that. So it has been a long way. It's almost up to date, I think. It's not in HTML bars, but sh uh, it should be soon, very soon. It has a very complex UI, like la an, an action house. Uh, you can see the match in real time with the ball moving around. It's quite complex. And we also have a huge amount of users. I think now it's six millions. And we have a web Ember client and native apps, iOS and Android. And at the time we tried, you see, okay, let's see if we can build this. I mean, the mobile, the, the desktop app was the first thing we did. And we tried to say, okay, let's move this to the mobile and see if it works. That was in Ember, 1.5, I think, we made, we made some tests. But uh, the main market of this is uh, Europe, Southern Europe, Spain, and a, big, big, a very big market is South America. And you can expect people in South America have the latest devices, I mean, iPhone 6 Plus and everything. So performance was very critical, and we decided to go native uh, for all. And I think it's a good thing, I mean, but. I learned very, uh, a lot of things there, and the most important one is if you want to make money, and it's why we are here, not here, but in the profession, and we go, go, go uh, <laughs> we wake up every morning and go to the office and everything, is that we need to think in mobile first. I mean, it's something that you have heard, you, you heard very, uh, very often, but it's, it's very true. I mean, these are some numbers. Uh, the last time I checked, there was around 4 million players that were that registered in the game using the desktop client and 500 uh, 500,000 so 500, uh, players using the iPhone app not even the Android the Android was not, was not released at this time this took 2 years and this took 2 weeks mm -hmm. you can see that there is a huge difference in users i mean the, and this is a uh, in a market, Spain and South America, where 93% of the devices are Android. And this is the iPhone app. So make the numbers. It's very important to be on mobile. The rest of Android. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is where the money is. So, but I have some numbers to share. I mean, this is some from a research of the GS, GSMA, this, uh, the mobile consortium that builds networks and everything. These are the numbers of the internet uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, there is around two millions, two billions of users, American billions uh, of users uh, with landlines in the world. And pretty much the same number of users with mobile, land, uh, mobile connections. But in five years from now, there will be around uh, the twice as much users in mobile than in desktop. And this is very important. These are us now, us in five years. This is the third world and the second world, South America, Africa, South Asia, etc. Now and in five years. I mean, this, this we are ab about to grow a 15% and it will double its size in, 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 in five years. So uh, in advance, 
on top of this, we have to think that there is a lot of devices that will exist in five years that are, they are pretty inexistent right now. Connected cars. Uh, there, is, uh, there is already a bunch of smart TVs, but will, they will not, you won't find a not a smart TV in five years from now. Every, every smart TV will, every TV will be a smart TV. And the Internet of Things, which we don't even know what it is, but will be something. <laughs> so there's a very important thing, thing about being native or going to the web. Because if you go native, you need to choose one path or the other, or both, or three of them. I mean, if you include Windows and Linux and everything. And the web is the only platform that is, will be in every, in every device you can imagine. I mean, will be in cars, will be in phones, will be in everything. That's a huge sell selling point for, for, for doing things in HTML. So right now, why are we treating a, a good mobile experience less, less, like a nice to have? Like something, OK, it's nice that this is this scale very well, it's responsive. But this is, I mean, right now we develop thinking in the machine we are developing with. I mean, this we, I develop in this, in this laptop. But my products would more, li more likely be used not on my laptop, rather on my phone. I, I carry my phone all the day, but not my laptop. Having a good mobile experience is core for your business. When I came to London six months ago, now I am a freelancer, but I started working on this company, that business. It's literally a name. And I, it's a company that makes native apps. I saw the Ruby and I do the backend of many apps. And I learned something there. UX is very important. I mean, it's you product owners used to care about the thing they sell. I mean, this app show needs to show the news or receive push notifications. But people, for example, from Google, from the Chrome team, they made a, a survey, a survey, and they discover, they ask news uh, or users of news, news apps, which feature they like the most about, about using an app rather uh, and not a web page. And they, 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 they thought that the response would be, we have offline news and we have, uh, we have uh, push notifications of important news. And the answer was, no, what we like is that the UX is very smooth. And this, people care about this de these details. So as developers right now, we are coming out in the middle ground between designers and coders. I mean, people doing our job, by example, in if we, uh, people that works in Ember. We need to care about the sign. We should aim to be in the middle. This is what I am. <laughs> 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 so what makes an app appealing to a user? Appealing, appealing means at the end sell, sales. I mean, you want to sell what you do. Basically, there is three pain points in mobile apps that we need to fix and we can fix right now. One of them is we want our apps to load fast, initial load, respond fast, and work offline kind of. That's, it's not everything can be done offline, well, of course, because we need communication, but it should at least not break completely. I'm not going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the last two uh, points, but about load fast, there is a few things like us as a community can do right now. There is a few interesting things coming. The first one is specific to Ember is Ember Fastboot. I mean, when we load a single page application, we first of all load the, load the HTML, then we discover the assets like the JavaScript and the and the CSS. We request them, we get them, and afterwards we boot our app and probably make another request to the backend to load the initial payload. I mean, something, maybe our user or, or the news or whatever. Ember Fastboot pretends, in this intention is to make everything uh, in one request. So we query our, our server, and there is an Ember app running on the server. It renders the HTML, sends the HTML and, and the assets and everything, and as soon as we have the HTML, we can display something. We can show this, the, 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 the app to the user. 
even if Ember is still loading things in the background. In fact, they are even making experiments to kind of serialize the initial payload within the HTML, because you can basically ser serialize the entire store and then pretty much dump everything into the store and you're ready to go. This will f make uh, our application much faster. Another thing people is working is removing jQuery as a dependency. Uh, we want HTML to be lightweight, and it's not. So the first step is basically remove things that are not mandatory and make it optional. jQuery should be one of them. Another is tree shaking will be much easier when ES6 modules are kind of finished and established. But the idea is if you have an app that only use part of Ember, why do you load all Ember? I mean, things like maybe mm, uh, sets. Maybe you are not using sets. In fact, I think they are deprecated now. I don't know. Mm. OK, uh, so the idea is if you can know in advance given the models you load, which part of Ember are you, what part of Ember are you using, you can just make a custom build with only the things you need. And these two are just general for any, any web application. HTTP2 will be, make things much faster because the, you can say, uh, make uh, server push content. So when you request the HTML, your server can know, OK, this guy is requesting the HTML. And every people, every, every, single, every single person that asks me the request the HTML, they also want the CSS and the JavaScript. So take it. I know you will need this. And browser catching. So why do I need to download the entire app each time I enter? I mean, it, with, with, if you go to the store and buy an app, you download the app and you have the app forever. With a web page, you basically each time you want to use it, you download the entire thing. So if we can cache this thing, you only need to ma make a request once in, I mean, in a month maybe, when, uh, depending how often you deploy. This is an interesting one, response fast. We want, as I said, very smart, very, very smooth uh, UIs. And a smooth, uh, a fast UI is how much time hap uh, there is between when the user makes an interaction and when the user gets the feedback. When we use the input, when we are talking about mobile, we are typically talking about fingers, I mean, touching things. It happens that we still think in clicks and drags, and it's not the case in mobile. We have another em 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 events. So please, right now, since, since this very moment, please stop using this. <laughs> um, have something like this. Use the touch start, touch move, and touch e events. It's kind of the uh, most down mouse up, but they are native. And you prevent the default. So if you are on, on a device that has this kind of events, these events will fire. And this won't, because it's prevented. So you, you will have the, the immediate response of a touch of a touch start, immediate response of a touch start event. And if it, this is reused between mobile and, and desktop, you still have this. So you can have the, the instant speed of touch events without having to mimic the click, which is a, a hack. Browsers implemented this fallback from touch events to click because at the beginning there was no web pages prepared to, to this. I mean, is, they need to, OK, uh, uh, someone taps here, and if it nothing re uh, listen for this tap, means, OK, it's a click. And it works. But clicks are atomic. They are not native. In fact, in, in iOS, by example, they have a 300 milliseconds delay. And touch events, by the, uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, you have fine grain control because you know when the touch begins, the touch ends, like with mouse down and mouse up. They are native, which means these are the actual events the browser fires. And with not, I mean, the click is something emulated, let's say. And it's instantaneous. I mean, if I listen for the tap start, tap start is, it fires immediately. An extra, you can have multi-touch. There is not something as people using two mouses to, two mouses to uh, make things. And the other part is how do we update the app? There is uh, this graph I take from, from a presentation of the Chrome Dev Summit. 
people, or users receive, uh, perceive things as blazing fast, instantaneous, when it's below 100 milliseconds, more or less. When, when you have something between 100 and 300, it's pretty fast. This is where people start to, okay, this is uncomfortably slow. And when you surpass the one second, people actually start to make questions. Did I click this button? I mean, <laughs> I, I, or the app is frozen. I, people doubt about, okay, I'm, did I, 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 maybe I did something wrong. So this is the pattern we usually <coughs> follow when do we develop apps. We, recon we make some kind of gesture recognition, re recognition, so we detect a swipe, and then we fire a transition. So we fetch the data, wait for the data, and then we display the new, the new route. Something like this. And I have a few videos. Let me put it on, uh, no, this one. Uh, this one. Uh, speed, a quarter. Play. I make a swipe, and when I lift the finger, I detect the swipe, I command to make a transition, and I transition. Let's, let's put it again. We, I made a sweep, lift the finger, and then is when things happen. But there is, not, there is nothing here. I mean, this, it might be even uh, seen like an accident. I'm here, and suddenly I'm in another article. I don't know why, because when you think about UX, animations are, in fact, something that are not just because it's pretty, it's because it's, it helps to build mental models. I have a very, uh, I, when I think about good UIs, I always think about material design in Google. I mean, this, in, you don't need to follow the rules of material design or the patterns or have these, these guidelines, but as a general guideline of how, of how to build a good UX, this is quite a good resource. This is an animation. Uh, uh, you click something and things fade in for the, or, or come in from the side. And this is the same thing, just like popping or appearing from the nothing. In nature, things maybe, um, apart from lightings, lightnings, nothing happens in a, in, a, in, a sec in, in a fraction of a second. People, uh, when something appears, it, ap it appears from somewhere. From somewhere. I mean, there is animation. This, is, this helps the user to understand what they are supposed to do. I have another video here. I'm sorry if I haven't shown any, shown any, code, any code yet. Uh, there will be at the end some demos. This is the same thing, the same uh, app. But uh, in this situation, I have the animation. I make the, the gesture at some point. OK, I made a swipe, and the things come here. This is not displaying the, con the content uh, any faster, but if a user makes a swipe to the, to the left and goes to the next news, the next article, he knows already that if he makes the opposite move, he will go back to the previous article. Uh, here so this is why using animations wisely can help us can help you to build a, a, a good user experience but there is a point where this is not fast enough or, and we want people to have instant feedback so if you can't make a network request go faster because there is latency and you can deal with it, you need to make things look faster. So a way to make things look faster is, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's next slide. Uh, this is, again, from this very good uh, talk by Paul, Le Paul Lewis, Lewis on the Dev Summit. When a user makes an, uh, an interaction with a screen, there is a, a few moments the first 100 milliseconds, the user is uh, not, sh I mean, it's, this doesn't perceive that the, the, his, his action has ended. 
which means you can w make work here, and at the end, when the animation, I mean, make animation, and when the animation ends, there is a few milliseconds where the user realizes that the animation has ended and he can continue working. So, uh, taking advantage of this, we can make things happen in parallel. So, if instead of gesture recognition, we make gesture tracking, so instead of waiting to the gesture to end and, be, and know that it's a swipe, I can recognize that the gesture is going to be a swipe because it looks like a swipe. Eventually, he will lift the finger. So, why wait? Let's, if a user makes a swipe, let's fetch the data and update the, update the view, even if I don't have the data to fill that view. And afterwards, make the transition. So, same slow speed. When you move, no, this is a false move. Now, you have the car coming in. You have the, you can, I mean, the user knows that the application is responding, even if they, I don't have still the, the, new, the next article uh, recovered from the server. So the user, I mean, when, when the user sees this, he knows, even if the, the information is still not available, he knows that the application is working. If a user has f f instant feedback, he knows that everything is going okay and it makes to happy users. So that's why it's important to make things happen as fast as possible and delay maybe update information to the point you can, but you already have shown the user that everything is working. And if you do this, it's very easy to say, okay, I have the pieces when the network is bad, I, this is still work, but when the network is fast or I is smarter than the network, the, uh, the smarter than the network, I can prefetch the content, I have the best experience possible. People don't need to wait. I mean, they see everything coming. And this is a, mo a mobile web page. I mean, there is very a, mo a lot of reasons to use native apps, but there is a lot of reasons why na uh, web, web apps can be better from some, from some kind of applications. So the, if we want animations to help us to improve the, the sense of speed in, in an app, they have to be smooth. That's when the frame rate crumbles. You, you, That's when they, they, they defeat the purpose. So, but JavaScript animation are quite hard. I mean, it's because to control everything involves using request animation frame, makes the maths and everything. And it can be challenging or at least mm, cumbersome. So there is a new API coming uh, to the web called Web Animations API. It's what <laughs> you wanted all your life, so we <laughs> but you were you wasn't aware. It's like the bastard kit between CSS animation and JavaScript animation, but it has the best of both of has the best of both parents. Uh, it's a new standard, it's declarative, like CSS, which means it's very easy to, very easy to use, and gives you full control of what you are doing, because you can control from JavaScript what's happening. Also has nice features, like CSS animation, it doesn't use the main thread, of the, it, runs on the, it can even run on the GPU. So it means it's very performant when the, if there is native support for them. And it gives you some nice features that you have to man do yourself with JavaScript. It's, you have free synchronization. We can, um, there, if there is even some things it wasn't even possible previously, like motion paths, which is I, w I define a polyline in SVG, like a mountain, and I want this object to follow this, like if it were, if it were a rain, uh, 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 some rails and a train. So this ball moves following this strange path, and it, it works. This is a small, uh, maybe it's a bit small. Um, there. This is the syntax of the basic syntax. You, its element is a DOM element. So you can you define a few keyframes. That's the origin, that's the ending, and a time. And you fire an animation, the animation run, and it's like if it has the same effect that having this 
this CSS on a class, this CSS on the other class, and add this class to the element. It just moves things around. Moves things around. Uh, you can specify like animations, things like delay, the easing, and the iterations, and it works like if it were uh, if it were uh, a CSS animation. But the key point is that when you call this, it returns a player, and with this player you can pause the animation, resume the animation, play the animation backwards, change the speed, seek a, a given point of the time. You can do pretty much everything you want with this. So means that you can control a CSS animation from JavaScript. There is a very good polyfill uh, from the uh, Polymer project. You can use it right now. So that means it's, you can use this on, on iOS, by example, that is not supported right now. It's only supported in Chrome. And it's coming to Firefox. Uh, you can use this polyfill. It's not as performant, this polyfill, as by example, JSAP or GreenSock or, or maybe Velocity. But uh, when, it support, when the support is native, it's blazing fast. I have a small demo here. This is uh, the code for making the animation with request animation frame, the most efficient way, and with, uh, with animations API. I have this div, it's a, a red div, and two buttons to trigger the, the animation. This is my code for the web animation thing. Uh, yes, sorry. And let me... There? Enough? Okay, this is the code for the, the web animations API. You define the, the, the keyframes, the options, and when I click the right button here, I just uh, call animate with the keyframes and the options. That's everything I do. And this is the code using request animation frame where I uh, request, uh, this is the, my starting point, my ending point, I do the math, and I call this function recursively to update things. And this is for a linear, for a linear uh, animation, not even easing and anything more fancy. Uh, you can see that this is with request animation frame, it works, it's just moving and scaling. This is with uh, weapon, uh, with, uh, with animation API. It's equally smooth because it's a very simple translation, uh, transition. But let's see something very interesting. Let's go full screen with this. Okay, I have this here. And uh, everybody's familiar with the timeline? Yeah. Okay, if you want to develop with, for mobile, you, are, you have this open all the day. It's, you need to measure things. This is, oops, this is, I have uh, this here, this button, I dollar zero dot click. I'm going, I'm, I'm calling this from JavaScript to make it easier. Um, and timeline, I record, I click this, I see the animation, and I stop. These are my frames. It's very smooth. You see that it's almost in this. Uh, very Here, this, this is the amount of time I'm consuming from my budget. This is the 60 frames per second boundary. So that means this animation is very fast. I'm not hitting any kind of bottleneck. It will be run very smooth on, on with JavaScript even. Let's do the same with this other thing. Inspect element, I do this. This is the, I'm selected the other button to measure. Um, timeline, a bit less clear. Record. Let's play the animation. And let's see our frames. There's no frames. <laughs> <laughs> there, it thought, <laughs> This is because it's not running on JavaScript. You can't measure what is not running. <laughs> this is happening on the GPU. So there's a few situations where JavaScript animations are still faster than CSS animation. But you can improve th these things as much as you can improve things using the, the, 
the engine of the engine of the of the of the browser. So you can expect CSS animation to be much more performant in a year from now because of this, because it, now browsers can make everything happen in C++ or whatever language they use it, the, the browser is done. And you have the perform the as you are as performant as you can be. You are you have the whole main thread for your app, which is nice. And I have a bigger demo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is my this is the same app uh, the same app you have seen before. Uh, I have this. I click this, and I can move this around. And I, there is something I can I want to show because it's a very simple use case of how to take advantage of this new API to make things very easy. Look at this. I have this menu on the bottom, and as you see, I move it dragging around, <laughs> and I have this cross on the top corner uh, being animated along with the movement. Uh, let's see how I did this. Maybe, maybe, no. Not, not this. Here. Uh, let's open um, the slide menu, uh, the slide menu HVS, no, the application HVS. And um, I think it's everything I need for now. I know, I need more things. Uh, the toggle menu and the um, overlay here. Let's put this on the side. If we see, if we look at the uh, application HBS, we see that we see that we have this slide menu. Uh, yes, sorry. We have this is uh, a bit more. We have the slide menu, which is a component, and I yield some contents, which are the links I my, that menu contains. I also have this other component, toggle menu, which is the button, the a hamburger button on the top corner, and I have this overlay, which is basically uh, when if you realize here, this is becoming darker because I have an overlay on top of it. And I synchronizing everything. In this case, I have this uh, set of animation which is called when this element is, is added to the DOM. And as soon as this element is on the DOM, I want to prepare the animation. So I cast the width because it's yes performant, and I create this animation. New animation is something that the polyfill provides you because you can instead of Calling element dot animate and return the player, you can instantiate a new animation object and pass the element. The difference is that this doesn't start animation right away; it gives you animation, and the animation starts when you call document dot timeline dot play, and, and you pass the animation to this. And I'm sending this animation with a send action to the controller. I'm doing the exact same thing here in this other component, which is the overlay, and the same here thing, which only this in case animation is more complicated, on the on the on the um, uh, on the toggle button, and in the uh, control uh, is application maybe yes. I have this setup animation which basically it's time I receive animation, I push it into an array, and I uh, schedule thi uh, things on the after render, because I know that in the after render everything will be added, so I will have all the animations already prepared. And what it do is the create animation fun uh, function, which what it, does, what it does is create an animation group. What I do is I create an animation groups which contains these three animations, and I, I Command document that time late dot play this group. If I tied these animations together, they mean I have only one player to control them all. So I can move the animation back and forward 
changing the, the, the time. And I basically calling this recursively on all the inner animations. So I can control every animation with only this little code. By example, in the slide menu, I have a few events. But this is the touch move events event. I just I have a, an abstraction. You don't care about this. The gesture uh, it's to detect swipes, if the speed, some, some something I did. But I just um, they say this dot player dot current time equals some math I did to say okay this is the fifty percent. So I change the time to the <coughs> if this animation is two seconds I set one hundred milliseconds. Sorry, uh, one thousand milliseconds. And I, I am in the middle. And everything is on the middle of the animation. So I can control things, and the same things work for sequences and everything. So you can have very complicated animations and control it very easily with one liners almost. And the other part is working offline. <laughs> I hope, I really hope you like this icon. I, I learned how to use Adobe Illustrator just for this. <laughs> uh, what if I tell you that you can make your app work offline in 20 lines today? Only in Chrome, but yes. <laughs> the introducing service workers. Uh, who heard of service workers before? It's the best thing since Buttercream. This is all the code you need to make your app offline. Everything. This is one of the approaches. There is a few approaches to make this offline. This doesn't work for, ever, though for every, every, every situation. But a, a service worker is a worker, like the web workers, which means it a, runs in a separate thread. But unlike workers, that don't, that, they don't have network, network access or DOM access. <coughs> but this doesn't have DOM access either. Uh, they are intended to intercept the main thread requests. So if you perform an, an, a, a, an, a request from the main thread and you have a service worker register, this service and with this fetch event listener, you will get, I mean, this code this will be execute, executed before the request actually outputs go out, goes out from the browser. That means that if I get this request, don't, um, the requests are streams. That's why I'm cloning because a stream can only be read can only be read once. That I'm cloning things. This is the request, uh, the fetching request. Uh, wait a moment. I don't remember. Uh, and this is, I want to respond to this request with an actual fetch to the server. So if I get a 200 OK or I just get a, a, a request successful, I can, I have the cache. I fill the cache with this response with, and I return whatever I get. So that means I have just cached this response forever. I mean, if this, I mean, if the content, if your content doesn't need to be cached because it needs to be updated, you can't use it. You can't use this, but. Uh, and if something fails, I try to return what is on the cache. That means if I am on airplane mode, by example, and I try to access a web page where I have been before, first of all, I try to make the request. I have no network. Then I look in the cache. It's in the cache. The user doesn't realize. It, it's served right away. And this is the code you need to, res to register the worker. This, is, this offline support file contains these 20 lines. And a small demo is, again, this thing here. Um, no, here. This is the same app. I, I've been here. And I, I basically, I, I've been in all the pages. So if I go here and stop the browser. I go here and reload. It works. I mean, it's 
I can navigate, I can go the, to, uh, to everywhere, I, uh, I can be here, expose newspaper here, change the, the animation to something different. Everything works because, <laughs> and it's 20 lines, 20 lines of code. Sorry? Uh, it caches by URL, so yes, yeah. it con includes the, the, the domain and port. There is a restriction to this. To this, uh, in, uh, like many other features coming into the web, you need to use HTTPS to have this thing available, uh, or or be on localhost, which is basically useful, useless. <laughs> 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 this is how it works. You have the page. The page make a request. The service worker intercept this request and runs its code. Its code, what it, does, what it does is basically makes a network request and if I get a network request, I populate the cache and returns the same, very same request. If I don't have network, if this fails, I will hit the cache and return whatever is in the cache. And this is only one approach. Uh, there is a lot of other patterns. We can prefetch content in advance because this, we can uh, use the cache always and only fall back to the network when I don't have this thing in the cache. It's the opposite thing I'm doing. This is what I call the offline first. I mean, if I have co content in the cache, this is the right content. Uh, save things for later, like I read it later. I want, I favorite, I make this, I want to write this later mm, and based on a, on a user interaction. I command the, the service worker to request this URL and store it for later. Or uh, return whatever is in the cache and make the, the, the request in the background. So the next time I have the more date, data. So it's, when you, it's not very important to you to have the most up-to-date information as long as you are very fast. Or this is very cool and it's not, we are not yet there, but this is very close listen for push, notific push notifications, even when your app is closed, because you, when you register a service worker, it's alive forever. So it, the browser is listening even, uh, for, for push, push notifications or for uh, messages from the server. Uh, and when you go back to your app, you have all the information there or you can use the native uh, push notification service of the, your operating system to actually show things. There is this very, very good blog post, kind of a cookbook for very recipes of Jake Archibald, is uh, a guy working in Google and kind of the main uh, promoter of this technology. Uh, when you can see a lot of usages of, of this technology, even Many very many crazy ideas like having the, your framework running on the on the on the thread because you can on a, the initial request maybe request a template have some code that has, knows how to use this template and f from that point on you request JSON mount the HTML on the on the worker and the request returns HTML and you just display HTML. <laughs> but it's possible. Uh, I have a bigger demo. Don't remember. Ah, yes, I do. <laughs> the thing is, uh, the difference between this and something that exists in the past, named App Cache, is that you have full control of the request and the content. Uh, that it's a very low-level uh, API. That means that you can do pretty much whatever you like. And in this uh, in the application, you, maybe you realize that here I have this sign. I know that I have no connection. And this is why in the code, I close this, uh, offline support, this thing here. It's, and I have this thing. When, the request fails and I return something from the cache. 
if this request is from an endpoint that matches, matches this regular expression, so the API, I know that it's a JSON request, so I can open it, add information to this request. In this case, I add a meta uh, offline support worker equals true, and send the request back. So I create a new request and send it. So basically, I intercepting the request and adding metadata to know, hey, this request has came from the cache. <laughs> deal with it in a slightly different way. And in my app, what I do is just, if every, every time in the, in the adapter, every time I receive a, a, an, a request, if it has this meta, I just enable this icon and that's it. I mean, it, it can be done, but it's just a silly example, but you can actually tamper your request and make things happen. So please don't wait. I mean, this is so, so powerful and so simple. You can start using right now. Even if right now it only works on Chrome and I think on, on Firefox behind a feature flag. It's, I mean, if it doesn't work, if, I mean, doing this feature detection, if it doesn't work, you just don't. And if it works, you have a f offline experience almost for free. So go ahead. I mean, there is no harm. And that's everything I have. Thank <laughs> you.